Robert, thank you so much for joining us uh, and uh, this opportunity for us to not only present uh, uh, on the book, uh, which you've written and we've published, which is a joy for us at Uncome Mountain Press, but also uh, to the general public to talk about your new book with our press, uh, The Church and the Pope, The Case for Orthodoxy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm not able to be at the conference, but I much appreciate this opportunity to speak in this way. I'm in. Glory to God. So let's start just with a very basic open question, and that is, uh, how did you end up writing this book? Why uh, did you take your time out of your very busy schedule? You've written, uh, what, almost two dozen or more now, I guess, uh, books uh, uh, on, on a variety of topics, but mostly on Islam. And this this topic is very different than what you usually write on. So tell us a little about the story behind the book. I'd love to hear that. Sure. Uh, I've been deeply involved with uh, the history of the church and, of course, with the church itself for many decades. And this was unfortunately, uh, for the most part, a time when I was in the Melkite Greek Catholic Church uh, for a variety of reasons, which uh, uh, some of some of which are pertinent to our discussion this morning. And uh Ultimately, a few years ago, I began to question some of the basic assumptions I've been operating upon uh, due to some incidents that had taken place and began to investigate some issues regarding the nature of ecclesiastical authority in the early church, which led me ultimately to return to the Orthodox Church into which I was baptized originally. Uh, and decided to write the book because uh, people I had known, associates in the Catholic Church, friends, uh, were saying to me they didn't understand why I would do such a thing at this late date, and uh, some were concerned for the state of my soul, which is a concern for which I am grateful, but at the same time I thought it might be helpful to some people, and I hope that uh, that it will be, that I would explain what led me to return to orthodoxy at this point. And so this is a brief explanation in this book of why exactly I did that. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So the book is, is by, you're looking at the first millennium, uh, and you are going through and you're basically saying, what is the place of the Pope in the first millennium, correct? Yes, that's right. Because I had, of course, been quite familiar, having been a convert to Catholicism in the first place, with the uh, apologetic arguments that Catholics would advance in order to establish that the Pope had always had not only primacy, but universal jurisdiction and infallibility, and that this was recognized in the earliest ages, although, of course, they did acknowledge that there had been a so-called development of doctrine that led to the definitions of the First and Second Vatican Councils. Uh, but, but when I began to look at the actual statements of the Holy Fathers and of the ecumenical councils, I began to see that uh, while the primacy of Rome was acknowledged, there was no indication of universal jurisdiction. As a matter of fact, quite a lot of contradictory evidence mm. that indicated that the Pope of Rome never had and never claimed universal jurisdiction over the entire church. And nor did was it ever understood that he was an infallible voice. And that this actually obviously contradicted the statements in Vatican I and Vatican II and called into question the entire doctrine of the uh, authority of the Pope as the Catholic Church defines it. So that must have been a bit of a shock after so many years uh, under uh, the Pope and in, in Catholicism. I mean, did, did you, did you, first of all, tell me, did you find this just on your own research? Uh, yeah. and, or did you have 
did you go to Orthodox sources or was it more just uh, just set out and start reading church fathers? How did you go about it? It was just setting out and reading church fathers uh, because it suddenly occurred to me, and this is something for which I'm grateful to God, that there was nothing that, that there was a conflation that the Catholic apologists were committing that they never acknowledged, and I don't think they're even aware of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope someday to be able to have a conversation with some of them and really ask them if they're aware that they seem to be conflating primacy with universal jurisdiction and infallibility. And so, in other words, they would see texts in the first millennium of the church's existence, and they would see texts from the Holy Fathers acknowledging the primacy of Rome and use that text as proof of universal jurisdiction and infallibility. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I suddenly thought, this, this, this is not legitimate. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to take for granted that there's universal jurisdiction implied in the primacy, especially when you have phenomena like the Pope Gregory the Great saying, Gregory the Dialogist saying there's no uh, universal bishop. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I thought that the efforts of various apologists to explain that away were extraordinarily unconvincing. Mm. Interesting. So you ran into such examples as Pope Honor Honorius or yeah. and, the, and the ecumenical councils and how they dealt with certain popes that had erred in the faith. That was also yeah. in your... Was that also a surprise that nobody nobody had ever really talked about that? Uh, well, I was aware of Pope Honorius and the condemnation by the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and the fact that he was called a heretic and that he actually did state a monothelite declaration in his letter to the Ecumenical Patriarch Sergius. Mm -hmm. But I was also aware that there were uh, Catholic apologists who said this was not an ex-cathedra statement, which of course is a practically a universal fallback, a Catholic fallback, you could say, in uh, explaining away these kinds of things, but also uh, that he obviously did not mean uh, the statement in a monothelite way since he was speaking about will in a diff with a different connotation from actually the possession of a human will. But it seemed to me that those objections ultimately were off the point because mm -hmm. he was ultimately condemned by the council itself, which showed that they thought that it was possible to right. condemn right. Pope for heresy in an ecumenical council, which nowadays in the, in the Roman Catholic framework, if they have what they would call, and if they had a Vatican III, for example, of another ecumenical council at this point, it would be inconceivable that they would condemn a pope for heresy. And so it seemed to me that the whole episode, whatever one may think of Pope Honorius' statement, mm. which I do think ultimately is heretical on its face, but that's really not the point. Whatever yes. one may think of it, it showed that it was a very different ecclesial environment in 680 from what it is in 2022 or in 1870 or 1965. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, we're in a completely different situation in terms of what the authority of the church is considered to be. And mm -hmm. I have to also add in that, that these are very important questions, not just as a matter of who's right and who's wrong and who should back down and apologize and who should not, uh, if there's ever to be any genuine or lasting reunion between the, the, the communions, it's much more than that. Because, well, I tell you, one of, the exam one of the instances that propelled me to undertake this study in the first place uh, was when I had a debate, and you can find this debate on YouTube. Uh, it's still there as far as I know. I haven't looked lately. But uh, I had a debate with Monsignor Stuart Strickland, who is the president of a Roman Catholic college in Kansas, I believe. And we debated on uh, Islam. Mm. Of course, I've written, as you noted at the beginning, written quite a bit about Islam. 
And so he was contending that Islam was a religion of peace, and I was contending that it's not based on the content of the Islamic texts. Now, the point is, is that he, he was arguing not only that I was wrong, but that I was a heretic. Hmm. And he said that I was a heretic because he said several popes have affirmed that Islam is a religion of peace. And the Second Vatican Council says that you have to obey the popes even when they are not speaking ex cathedra if there is a statement that is frequently repeated and so on. And so it occurred to me at this point, it was, I was rather dumbfounded that he could say that I was a heretic for something that's not a matter of the Christian faith at all, but a matter of another religion, that mm. what he was saying was essentially that you have to obey the Pope and agree with the Pope no matter what, in any situation. And it seemed to me this is a clear deformation of the idea of authority in the church and mm -hmm. that the, the idea that the Pope can say uh, anything about anything and that if he repeats it often enough and if several popes agree with him, then you have to go along, that this was clearly something that would lead, could lead people drastically astray Indeed. and might even endanger their souls. Indeed. And that it was, mm -hmm. therefore, the question of authority was not just a matter of uh, ecclesiastical one-upmanship or, or, or debate ability or, or argumentation. It was something much larger than that. It really goes to the, the identity of the church, which means the identity of Christ himself. Yes, because... Because Christ, Christ's body, Christ is the head of the church. And so when you say that this one bishop is now infallible, essentially, practically, even though he's not quote, ex cathedra, as they always like to say. But here you're saying, no, it's far beyond that. And he's quoting councils, uh, first and second uh, Vatican councils, that are saying beyond the the strictly defining the dogma that the those subjects of the Pope must obey him no matter what. I mean, that is, that is I think, many I think many today would, would be dumbfounded among, in Catholicism to hear that as... Uh, uh, you know, that that is the case, uh, yeah. especially with somebody like Pope Francis, who many traditional Roman Catholics are quite disturbed by in, in yeah. terms of his positions. Yeah. Well, Father, that's it's it's very widespread. The, another incident that uh, I, I think I mentioned the debate with uh, Strickland in the book, but one uh, incident that I didn't mention, because, of course, it's it's not a book about my life. Uh, sure, sure. I I was asked several years ago, actually, probably about 10 years ago now, to, uh, and I was still in the Melkite Greek Catholic Church, which is a, an Eastern church in communion with Rome. And I was asked by Alitea magazine, a Catholic online publication, to write a regular weekly column. And I wrote one or two and then was dismissed and was told that. Uh, the columns were no longer desirable because the Alitea editors had realized that I was deviating from Pope Francis' line on Islam. Hmm. And so consequently, they didn't want to run it. And so here again, I thought, well, you know, what Pope Francis thinks about Islam is not the Christian faith. It couldn't hmm. possibly be the Christian faith because Islam is not the Christian faith. But... Hmm. As far as they were concerned, it was something that they had to go along with. Mm. And I thought this is a, a very dangerous path that could lead people into all manner of errors. Indeed. Indeed. I think that's exactly what Pope Gregory was getting at. And what many Orthodox apologists have said again and again for a thousand years is that this is potentially someone in, the, in this position could lead people far astray uh, and 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 uh, eventually deny Christ if if he was to be in a position uh, of such authority over people's souls. Uh, tell me something. Uh, in your coming to Orthodoxy, through this this process of looking at the first millennium and seeing that in fact the Orthodox Church is the is the same church uh, in terms of authority at least that you studied and saw in the first millennium, it is today. Many who are Looking to the orthodoxy from Catholicism, uh, we'll say yes, but look at the chaos in orthodoxy. You have now a schism between Constantinople and Russia. You have this, you have that. 
uh, you know, uh, we present a clear uh, teaching from the magisterium. You know the arguments. You've heard them and probably, you know, uh, very well versed. Uh, what did you find when you became Orthodox? And did it, did, did you get thrown off and say, oh, my goodness, uh, uh Yes, the Pope's not the, not infallible and not universally uh, a primate, but uh, look at uh, orthodoxy is filled with uh, chaos or something. What did, what did you find when you became orthodox? Well, orthodoxy is filled with chaos to a certain extent. <laughs> and uh, I find the, the schism between Constantinople and Moscow to be a source of grief. It's tremendously yeah. unfortunate and completely unnecessary, and I hope of that course. it's healed quickly. Uh, However, there's a big difference. And I actually now have two experiences of conversion and, and, and impressions uh, compared to what I was reading, you know, real life impressions after reading a great deal. Uh, and that is in the 80s when I joined the Catholic Church and then uh, a few years ago when I returned to Orthodoxy. And when I joined the Catholic Church, and especially uh, at first going to the Roman Catholic Mass, I was kind of thunderstruck by the difference between the Catholic Church of Cardinal Newman and the, uh, the Catholic Church of the other people that I was reading and the Catholic Church of Vatican II that was uh, quite, quite a bit different. And I did not have that impression in the last few years, uh, starting to attend once again a Greek Orthodox parish, uh, the faith, the liturgy, it's very clearly always the same. Yeah. And so whatever chaos may be going on around, the fundamental virtue of the Orthodox Church, and I think the protection that the Lord affords it, is that it doesn't play with the liturgy. Mm -hmm. And that that means that the people encounter Christ in the church as they should and as they have through the centuries. Mm. And it's not as if the, the liturgy is always changing, which gives the impression that the faith is always changing. Mm. And when the Roman Catholics do that, I think that that is one of the primary ways that they're misleading people and endangering people's souls mm. by giving the impression that the faith is something that's revised every few years. And, you know, I've even heard Islamic apologists in, in, in my other world saying, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church changes its faith every few years. And I think, hmm. well, I understand why you can say that and people will believe you hmm. uh, because of the liturgical changes. The liturgy is the way people encounter the faith, the primary way. And, the ancient, so, and the, we have the ancient uh, witness that the way you pray is the way you believe. Exactly. You're inseparable. Yes, I can say Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi. Yes. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And uh, and that's not unrelated to, uh, I mean, it, it, it seems to me to be a, a massive uh, strike against the continuity of Catholicism with the ancient church as well, not just the diversion from authority, but now you have a diversion from the way we pray and we have prayed for for 2000 years so it seems to be consistent with a diversion from authority in other words it's it's not this rock that they want to present continually on the rock we have the rock etc uh, things if that were the case we would not have these massive changes over the last 50 to 100 years absolutely uh, yeah and in the 80s when i joined up i remember saying to friends this is not what i meant to join Mm. This is not what I thought I was joining. This mm. is something else altogether. And so mm -hmm. I'm very happy to find the Melkites who celebrate, of course, the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil the Great. Uh, you, could, you could think you were in an Orthodox church in some Melkite parishes, not all of them. But that creates problems of its own because the, the Eastern Catholic churches, they don't really have an identity of their own. Some of them are Orthodox, some of them are Roman Catholic. Uh, and it's very difficult for them to bridge the gap. Mm. Yes. So there you have an inconsistency in terms of identity as well. Uh, you have a Eastern identity, but theology and authority is is not. And if everything flows from that Eucharistic synaxis and the divine liturgy is the core, 
and it's kind of a schizophrenia. It would seem to me. To oh, exist. very much. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I can tell you, you know, I remember in my old parish, my Melkite parish, that uh, the pastor was very orthodox, and so the second Sunday of Lent was the Sunday of St. Gregory Palamas. Now, the, there are some Melkites who reject that, and they do they do something else that I've now forgotten for the second Sunday of Great Lent, not Palamas. But when we would put out the icon of St. Gregory Palamas and uh, celebrate that, there were other people in the parish who would get angry and mm -hmm. say, you shouldn't be celebrating a, uh, someone who is from the from the post schism era. Well, and, if they if they if they actually knew what Saint Gregory says about about the filioque <laughs> and the and the many other things, I think they would say we have a good case. Why are you celebrating Saint Gregory? Because he condemns um you know very clearly the teaching of the filioque, which thank God uh I, I think I need to tell all of our listeners that we have now translated and published that work by St. Gregory Palamas into English, and that's available through Uncle Mountain Press, which is a, a, a kind of an event, I think, for Orthodox publishing in the English language. So it's interesting you point out St. Gregory Palamas. He is, he's a great example of, the, of this schizophrenia and also this um, post-Vatican II reality is that there, as I pointed out in other, at other times uh, in interviews and in podcasts, you have them on the one hand clearly saying the Orthodox Church is, is the church, I mean, in terms of it, the divine liturgy, divine grace, the priesthood, everything, post-Vatican II at least, if not earlier, they're saying this is the reality, and yet they're saying, but they're they're missing something. They're missing something. And what is that? It's the authority of the Pope. But from an Orthodox theological standpoint, it's just, it's just very bizarre, because if you have Christ, you have divine liturgy, you have everything, and that's from what every, everything flows from that reality and that relationship. So whatever you're missing can't be more important, can't be something that really affects anything in terms of your life in Christ. And they would say that you could become a saint in the Orthodox Church. So in that sense, what is papal authority in the end of the day? Does it really matter? Well, if, if this you're going to accept it. There are many traditional Catholics who think it's an affliction at this point hmm. because uh, Pope Francis is uh, clearly not an Orthodox Christian. I mean, in the sense of even holding to the Roman Catholic faith. Mm, so uh, he's just, uh, and, and that's so strange, you know. I, I remember seeing a few years ago that uh, a, a Roman Catholic parish near where I live here, they, uh, somebody went and I had the, I was get handed the bulletin and it said they're going to have a Pope Francis study group. And I thought, why would anybody want to? St he, you study what this man says, and you're going to be straying farther and farther from the Christian faith. Mm. And this, mm. this is an indication of the the dangers of this entire idea of authority. Let me ask you, and before we close, uh, again on a personal note, so you've you've written a book. It's come out. It's circulating. It's, it's new, but it's getting out there. Have you had any responses from your old stomping grounds and and um, any any um, any light that there might be some discussion? Uh, would you welcome that uh, if if there was a Roman Catholic apologist that would like to interview or debate or anything like that? What do you think? How how would that uh, would that be something welcoming? Yes, absolutely, Father. I'd love to have a discussion, a debate. I haven't heard from anyone. I even sent the book to a few people, but uh, haven't heard back yet. I hope to soon, and that perhaps uh, an honest and respectful discussion could be quite illuminating, I hope. And I look forward to being able to set those up. I think it, I think it's a, it's, an, it's a very interesting way to find oneself back to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, uh, because it it is a make or break, do or die issue for Catholicism. You cannot, you cannot really, can you remain in Catholicism if you understand the Pope as the first millennium? And can, can there be a totally different authority in the first millennium from the second millennium? Well, I know people who do. So it, it can in the sense of, yes, people ignore the contradiction. 
I know I know Mel, many Melkites actually who mm. uh, completely embrace the Orthodox ecclesiology and mm. like to pretend that they're Orthodox, except that they're in this Catholic Church. Mm. I, I know them personally, uh, but I don't think you can be intellectually honest and do that. Mm. So it's a it's a it's a kind of crucifixion for them to to depart and to embrace the truth of orthodoxy and walk away from the pope it would be a kind of a i mean did you you, you went through a process of of kind of both liberation but also crucifying the intellect and saying what i thought what i understood to be the case is no longer and i have to i have to you know give up what is what is my life i mean essentially in many ways right my friends my community i have to walk away from that that that's very hard for a lot of people sure uh and yes there's no doubt that it was uh the, the the thing about it's a strange thing about religion in general and that is of course that it's all caught up with people's ethnic identity uh people's intellectual worldview and perspective and so there are all manner of non-rational considerations that come in and i've always tried to discover the truth in these matters but i find that many people simply aren't interested in that mm -hmm. they're interested in maintaining a certain ethnic connection and identity or a certain allegiance to a certain group and and so they're not really even interested in considering the question from the standpoint of well what's actually true and what isn't that's a tragedy because of course our lord says if you you will know the truth and the truth will set you free Yes. So, so uh, we clamor about freedom night and day in, in our modern world. I wonder if we have any idea what it means, truly. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you so much for allowing us to have the honor to publish it. Uh, I pray and hope for many more. I know you're working on a very interesting book coming up. I, I wish I was going to publish this one. Uh, to tell you the truth, I, but I, I'm sure it'll have a much better and wider circulation with whoever you're going with. But tell us a little bit about that, the, the one that we've talked about a bit. Thank you, Father. Yeah, is that okay? Can we talk about that? Is it too early? Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's very early in the sense that the book's not even finished, so it's not available to order or anything. But uh, God willing, I will be able to finish it, and it should be out next year. Uh, right now, it's tentatively called How the Byzantines Saved Civilization. I'm not sure we're going to go with that altogether, but it's a, it essentially a history of the Roman Empire and its Byzantine phase, or what is usually called the Byzantine Empire. It's a uh, also a comparison of the that empire in various particulars with the modern age, uh, generally more favorable to the empire than to the modern age. And I so it's I think it will be illuminating for I hope it will be illuminating for people to see what a Christian polity was like and what it could be and how it can be preferable to this uh, uh, morass of confusion and misdirection that we're living in today. So in your book, do you do you refer to you refer to as the Byzantine Empire or do you refer to it as the Roman Empire? It's one of our pet peeves, uh, uh, because historically it was never called the Byzantine Empire, of course. That's correct. And I explain that in at some length in the book. I do refer to it as the Roman Empire and refer to the people as the Romans. But to begin with, I have to explain all that. Yes. And so the title may end up having Byzantine in it, so people know what it's about. Uh, yes. But since these this is common parlance, but it, it's very clear in the book that uh, not only did they never consider themselves to be Byzantines, they never even used the word until after the empire fell. The people who were uh, Christians, Orthodox Christians in the area of Constantinople, not only referred to themselves as Romans during the time of the empire, but still do. And yes. I even quote uh, ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew referring to the tiny remaining community in Constantinople today as Romans. And yes, so yes, it's, yes, uh, yes. Uh, if you go to, if you go to Lebanon and you speak to the Arab speaking Christians, they call themselves Roman Orthodox. Exactly. That's their identity. That's our, that's our identity as, as Christians, which is, 
which is mind boggling for people who've grown up with the idea that Roman means Latin, Western, and all the rest. And just it drives home how far we are from historical reality, which, which then affects our reality today. It really Indeed. does. So that's why you're, that's why this new book is going to be really important for a lot of people. It's about half done. It's going to be a big book, much bigger than the church and the Pope. Yes. And uh, about half done. It's already twice, twice the size of the church and the Pope now. And when it's well, done, it'll be about four times that size. And so I should complete it in January. God willing it should be out probably late next year, unless the world is engulfed in some cataclysm by then. Well, may it may, as we say in Greek anyway, may it walk, may it walk. In other words, may many people buy it. And, uh, and uh, it's, um, it's a joy to, to have you as one of our authors. Thank you so much. Thank you. A joy, an honor, great honor for me to be published by uh, Uncut Mountain Press. We look, for many, we look forward to many more books on these topics. I think uh, you've, you've done, what, 23 or 24 books on Islam? 26. 26. Yes. You probably said everything that can be said <laughs> at this point. Yes. Let's, let's hear some. Let's hear more about orthodoxy and, and Roman Empire, Roman civilization. I would look forward to that. Great idea. Yes, I would love to publish another book with Uncut Mountain Press. So we'll we'll talk about that. All right, all right, Robert. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Bye bye now. Bye. <laughs>